enjoys finding other ways to see familiar data that reveals a different perspective or illustrating situations in which the obvious understanding of the data is misleading or masks some deeper truth. Um, she's also a good friend of mine and a great person and a really good service performer. <laughs> yeah. We'll to talk to her about that afterwards. So stick around for a happy hour. <laughs> Um, hi, thanks so much for having me here today. I really appreciate Allison inviting me to talk about data visualization. Um, I, uh, today I'm going to talk about same data, different visual forms, data visualization specifically for scientific discovery. Um, I'm a data visualization designer and engineer, um, and this is just a smattering of some of my work uh, from my portfolio. So some of the common first lessons you might have learned if you've heard anything about data viz are that pie charts are bad. Non-zero bar charts are bad. Data dual y-axis are bad. Rainbows are bad. Chart trick is bad. A high into data ratio is bad. Everything is horrible and you shouldn't do any of it. This kind of reminds me of how we talk about food a lot of the times. <laughs> that everything is bad for you. And this isn't really that much fun and doesn't really tell you what, doesn't make for fun meals, doesn't really tell you what to eat, doesn't really tell you what to do, doesn't tell you why these things are bad if they're always bad for you. Um, Based on this advice, you could just be like, well, we probably just shouldn't eat any food at all. But that probably wouldn't turn out very well. Um, so I tend to prefer the Michael Pollan approach of eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That gives you some good general guidelines that you can work within um, and tells you what you should be doing. Um, so today I'm hoping that I will give you the data viz equivalent of Michael Pollan. Uh, so what should you do in data viz, especially for scientific discovery? One, know your goals and consider your constraints. Two, look at your data. And I realize that sounds trivial, but it's the most important part. Um, use color intentionally and make small multiples. And by small multiples, I just mean many charts that you look at at the same time that are related to each other. So I first want to talk about what I mean by knowing your goals and considering your constraints. And in data viz, like in biology, form is function. I remember my AP biology high school uh, teacher explaining that form is function, and then there's a relationship between what, how a thing is shaped and what it looks like um, and what it does. And that is very true in data visualization as well. Um, there should be a strong relationship between why you design something the way it is and, and what the goal is for that visualization and what the data is underneath it. Um, and two of the major categories of visualization for why you might create a visualization are for communication or for, science or for analysis and discovery. Um, and these have really different goals and constraints. And there's a lot of differences, but a lot of them comes down to things like for communication, you really want to attract the audience's attention. You have to convince the audience they want to look at this thing in the first place. They want to give you your time and attention. Um, does it give the message across successfully? Um, and is it true to the data? Is it not misleading? Um, on the analysis side, you have a different set of constraints. These are more things like how much of your time and attention does it take to actually create it and look at it and understand what's happening. Um, and especially, most importantly, if something in your data is, is important scientifically, do you actually see it in the visualization? Can you see the things that are important? And at the end of the day, that's more important than almost anything else. And how this comes through is that you might make very different visual forms for these two different purposes. Um, this is uh, work that I did on when babies are born um, and published in Scientific American uh, last year. Um, so on the communication side, it's highly polished, um, really intended to be immediately understandable um, and, and very attractive and like, appealing to look at. On the analysis discovery side, um, and kind of this was actually made for a talk about seasonality in data, um, and the point was, it was okay to have this repetition. Um, it was actually good to have the repetition um, and have some extra information. These are very clearly different purposes, and each one was really good at what it was trying to do, I think. Um, but they look very different from each other. Um, and so today, I really want to talk about specifically about scientific analysis and discovery. And there's two major purposes for creating visualizations within this realm. One is iterative exploratory analysis. You're there, you're in your tool, you're in Excel or R or Python or MATLAB. Um, you're in the process, you're making some graphs, you're doing some analysis, um, you're going back and forth. Um, the second is a data processing pipeline, um, which is more when you get a batch of data at one time. The boat comes in, um, you get the new data off of it, you run it through your system, 
you run the scripts, um, maybe it cleans the data, tests it, does quality analysis, starts the, and starts the analysis. Um, and I think that has, these are very related, um, but they have a few different constraints. So for the second one, I do have my uh, Michael Pollan-esque phrase that you want to have many charts, mostly boring, and important things should be obvious. And I really want to point that out right here that for communication, space is a huge constraint. You like, don't have that much space in the paper, et cetera. When you're doing things for yourself, that's often not a constraint. It's much more about your attention. So it's okay to make a lot of charts if they're gonna be really easy to understand what's going on. And it's totally okay if they're boring, if that means that, hey, my data is good. It was easy to tell that like, I didn't break anything, my sensors all worked. This also happens at the per chart level. Um, so you're in your analysis, um, what type of chart do you make? Do you make a radial line chart or do you make a heat map? Um, these are actually both data from here. I picked up the open data um, off of the Moss Landing website um, and did some analysis on it for this talk. Um, these are the exact same data, um, but you might choose one or the other if you have a different purpose in mind. Um, the, the lines might be easier to kind of get a sense of like, oh, like where's the wind coming from? There's a really strong sense of directionality that's super intuitive, but it's actually really hard to see any small numbers of wind speed because the, the line length is wind speed, so you can't see things in the middle. For the other one, you can. It might be just different reasons. One is not better than the other, they're just there for different purposes. So throughout this talk and throughout your data visualization, I really encourage you to think about like, why are you making this chart? What do you want to see? And does your visualization show you that? Um, in this next section, I just want to encourage you to look at your data, <laughs> um, which sounds super trivial, but isn't, because we only have so much time. Um, and it still takes effort to make a good chart. And my hope is that we can reduce the amount of effort it takes by having a few tips and tricks and also having a better idea of some of the approaches you might take. Um, but it still takes effort every time. Um, so I hope that you will find that effort worthwhile um, and be convinced that it's worthwhile um, and, and take the time to look at your data. And for a little bit of historical uh, uh, perspective, um, this is a 1977 kind of early exploratory data viz book um, on uh, by Tukey. And he writes that there is no excuse for failing to plot and look. Um, you'll note this is a section on how do you plot without graph paper. Um, so he says, even if you don't have graph paper, there is no excuse for failing to plot and look. Um, there's also a huge section uh, in this book on um, where to buy the best tracing paper um, and how to buy like really affordable tracing paper. So our tools have changed. <laughs> um, but even if you had to draw all of your data points by hand, there's no excuse to plot and look. Um, so do that extra Google search, find the, find the command that you need, um, and look at your data. In this same era, um, Anscombe wrote a book, uh, wrote an article called Graphs and Statistical Analysis, um, which resulted in something called the Anscombe's Quartet. And he started saying, um, on the usefulness of graphs, most textbooks on statistical methods and most statistical computer programs pay too little attention to graphs. This was true in 1973. Unfortunately, I think it is still true now. Uh, maybe not quite as true as it was, um, but I think it's still a challenge um, that data visualization is still emerging um, and uh, still something that sometimes I think feels like a nice to have and not as critical as, as I think it is. To make this point, Anscombe plotted these four graphs. These are four different data sets. Um, they have the same number of observations, same, all the major like summary statistics that you would do. The mean on the X, the mean on the Y, the regression coefficient, the equation of the regression line, sum of squares, they're all exactly the same. But they're pretty different. And it's obvious as soon as you make the graph that these are really, really different data sets. And I think that's one of the reasons, it's really important that like no matter how good your stats are, it's only as good as the questions that you're asking. And data visualization is a great way to ask questions. And it's also a great way to figure out what questions you should be asking next to, have, to create those like aha moments where you're like, that looks funny. I wonder what's happening. Uh, the, 19, uh, the 2016 version of this is the data source dozen. So a group remade, uh, inspired by Anselm's Quartet, they made a group of 12 uh, charts that again all have the same mean, median, et cetera, and it includes a dinosaur. So that's great. Uh, there might be a dinosaur in your data. And I mean, literally here, there probably are dinosaurs in your data because they're shells. So. <laughs> 
Um, in the same paper, uh, they more seriously um, included a uh, box plot, um, which is kind of a standard method for showing um, mean, median, and a bunch of the major stats, and six different data sets that all have the same exact box plot. Um, but when you look at them, whether with a jittered scatter plot or with a histogram, those six data sets are obviously different. Um, so both look at your data and look at your data in detail. Um, the next topic I want to talk about um, is, is starting to get a little bit more tactical. So we want to make graphs, we want to look at our data, we know what our goals are, how do we do it? Um, and every time you use color, it should be with intentionality. There's a lot of good reasons to use color, um, there's a lot of bad reasons to use color, there's a lot of, you can debate endlessly which colors you should use and why, um, but at the end of the day, it should be a choice. And one of the reasons that you should do this is to focus attention. Color is really good at grabbing attention. So I want to start with a demo about pre-attentive processing for hue and intensity, um, mostly for hue. So here is a set of numbers, and this is actually an example that was inspired by storytelling with data. Um, I have her book on the side if you want to see it afterwards. Um, she actually taught the first workshop that I went to in 2011 when I started getting into data viz. Um, she's an amazing workshops, books, and her blog is fantastic, so check them out. Um, and this example was inspired by some of her work. So is there anything interesting in this set of numbers? Oh, very nice. <laughs> the reveal comes early. <laughs> um, how many of you saw that? <laughs> um, how, about, how many sevens are there? Does it get any easier to see the sevens now? Does it get any easier to see the sevens now? <laughs> How about the number of threes? There's a lot. Maybe there's some trend for where they are. Maybe not. Maybe just random. Uh, and then what about the ones? <laughs> and there is only one one. It is the loneliest number. <laughs> Um, so the, that, we just to show, um, it's having this hue as a spotlight color um, is, is, makes things jump out that are otherwise fairly difficult to see for most people. Um, and in this case, it, it can jump out and it becomes immediately obvious. Um, so I wanna show an example kind of from the wild, from the internet. Um, this is from Bloomberg. They did a really nice job with color on this chart about uh, total area of Arctic sea ice. Um, they were looking they have a nice color spectrum for all the years in the past, so you can kind of see like the most historic data to more recent data. And then this red spotlight 2017, immediately obvious, um, immediately focuses and grabs your attention. And this was for communication, but this is a really, I think we should use this technique also in analysis to help focus our own attention and see what we need to see in the graph. And the, an example from my own work, um, looking at highlighting points by category of interest. Um, this is part of an interactive gene expression lookup tool for neuroscientists um, at Yale uh, as a consortium project. Um, this is the tool, and you can see that uh, the person has um, chosen, I'm, gonna, I'm not even gonna say the name, has chosen a type of cell, <laughs> um, and those are highlighted um, in the graph. And you can see um, where the blue points are, and you can see how they compare uh, to the background, you can kind of see that there's value in having that context because none of the blue points are in the top of the chart. They're all more in the center. So it's a way of having, keeping context in the background while also um, bringing to the foreground the thing that you want to pay attention to. Um, so I went ahead uh, to, I want to give some code examples and data examples. So I uh, went ahead and found some data from here, um, pulled down December 2017, um, got the weather data, uh, did, this is going to be an example in R, um, kind of set up my uh, set up my libraries. Um, I set the theme to black and white because I love having a white background in the back. Personal choice. Um, read in the data a ton of different information. I noticed that there's wind speed, wind direction, barometric pressure, um, and so I started getting curious. Uh, I did a couple. Um, I made some discrete buckets that I wanted to use later. So now let's dive in. Did we did our homework? We can start doing some analysis, taking a look at the data. So let's look at wind direction and wind. Um, so I make a scatter plot. Um, I'm using some opacity, alpha equals 0.1, because there's a lot of occlusion, there's a lot of data points here. Um, and then we might add some color. So if I add color for is it raining or not raining, if I just add color equals rain, 
um, discrete, I've bucketed it, um, I get something that looks like this. And through color, I can kind of see what's going on. Um, but I think it's a lot more obvious, because what I really want to know, is it raining or is it not raining? And what are the data points? What's the relationship between wind direction and wind speed when it is raining versus when it's not raining? Um, I am slightly cheating here. Uh, because it's raining a lot less than when it's not raining, um, it'd be hard to see the raining points by themselves. So I did have some different opacity values just to make that, bring that rain to the foreground a little bit more. Um, so using this technique, we can, now we can kind of start focusing and seeing. Um, we've got some rain here. Um, this section, wind coming from this set of angles, um, didn't have as much rain. And then our high point, our highest wind speed, um, around 300 degrees was also when it was raining. Um, not necessarily earth, like ground shaking science, but starting to get an idea of what's happening in the weather here. You could also look at time series, time versus wind speed. Um, again, this is what you get by default. It's, it's not that bad in this case, um, but uh, it really can pop um, by using that highlight color. And you could argue that you maybe want two different highlight colors, one for some rain and one for more rain. That would be totally fine as well. Um, so that's talking about using color to highlight, to focus attention, to really say, like, I care about this part of my data. I want to bring that to the foreground and push everything else to the background to provide context. Another way that you can use color intentionally is by choosing appropriate color schemes and with meaningful mappings from numbers to colors. And this might be more for where, like, you're not sure what you want to pay attention to yet. You want to just get a sense of, like, what is your data, but want to do it in an appropriate way. Um, so again, let's take another look at this demo and these familiar numbers. So let's add some color. Uh, Veritas is a, is a popular color choice um, in a lot of, in Color Brewer and Python, um, Seaborn. Um, so here's it applied to our numbers. I find it makes the nines really pop. Um, so we can also try inverting it. And now I think we really see those zeros pop out, maybe the ones and twos a little bit. Um, I tend to find this to be a very like foreground background color scheme where I notice the bright colors a lot more. Um, zero to nine is ascending, so it might make sense to have a sequential color scheme um, that's a little softer. So this is the blues. Um, might start noticing some lightness down here. Um, this is another sequential option that's more orange based. If you're interested, maybe you're interested actually in the extremes. You're less about like going from zero to nine. Maybe what's really important in this data set is comparing to 4.5. Um, so you can throw a diverging color scheme on it. This is the brown to green. Um, and start seeing, okay, the browns are in the lower half, the greens in the upper half. Um, one downside of this is when you get a brown, dark brown next to a dark green, it can be a little hard to tell apart. We can also clamp the extremes. Maybe what we're interested in is kind of middle or extreme. Um, so we can start making choices about how we map between colors and numbers, not just use the default. And if we really don't care about the extremes, we really want to focus on that middle data. Maybe their extremes just had data that was corrupted in some way. Um, we can just throw them away entirely. Um, or we can do the opposite. See the middle is totally fine. Um, maybe we're looking at air, uh, some sampling air, and we want to kind of see where we're having the problem. Um, so we throw away the middle and only focus on the extreme. You can focus on the front half of the data, just look at zero through four, and kind of make everything else pretty grayed out. Um, or it can be more direct and be like, you know what, I'm interested not just in the threes, not just in the fives, but the set of three to five I think is really interesting. And now we can really pop out that this corner has only threes, fours, and fives, and maybe that's important. So this is a bit of a constructed example, <laughs> um, but I hope that it's shown that just different colors and different mappings reveal different things. And it's not just about choosing um, what color scheme is important, but it's also about choosing the mapping between the colors and the numbers. Um, so I hope that you ask yourself, what, uh, what, do your, uh, what aspects of your data do you want to see? Do your colors and your color mapping show you that? And if not, how can you change your color map or your mapping from numbers to colors to see the part that's important to you? I think this is especially important in situations where you have a, a super extreme value. Maybe you have super outliers in your data. And if you just do the naive thing that most of our programs do, that just map from min to max, that super outlier is gonna draw a lot of your color map with it, um, and you might lose a lot of information in the middle of your color map. And really, a lot of times we're only seeing the outliers. 
Um, this is an example of some, some work that I'm uh, doing with Lucian Yang at the Google Accelerated Science team in Mountain View, um, and John Gregor of Caltech. Um, I can't talk exactly about what this project is about, but um, this is a situation where this represents uh, a scientific experiment that happens on a plate, um, and we're really worried about what if there's problems where like, some of the plate is um, different than other parts of the plate because of experimental error. Um, so we run these experiments all the time, and every time we look at them, we want to look at all the different plates and see, um, is it coming through? And this, in this situation, within a plate, everything's supposed to be the same color. And this was like a pretty good color scheme that we had going on. Um, but I did want to go ahead and tweak it and try to make it even easier to see those differences. And so I switched it to this one. And for me, when I was looking at this in, in the actual example, um, I didn't notice this. There were just too many dots. There's, this is part of a larger thing. I didn't notice that difference here until I switched to the new color scheme and it became a yellow versus green. And suddenly it popped out at me. And now I can't see it. I can't not see it here anymore. Um, and same thing, there's some differences here that I, did, that I still kind of barely see or can't really perceive here, but I can perceive here. Um, and same thing here. And so there's times where getting some more hue variation, getting some more perceptual distance in your color scale, tailoring your color scale to, to what you want to see. Um, in this case, it was the, we're looking at data from zero to one, but most of the data is between like zero and 0.3. So getting a lot more of the differentiation in those low values so we can see the differences there uh, made a really big difference and meant that we could see issues that we hadn't been able to see before. Um, this is the same project, um, and this was a uh, uh, color scheme we're using. We care about this triangle a lot. It's a very important triangle. Um, and we had some problems with this color scheme. Um, this is Veritas, but we found that we were really attracted to the yellow um, numbers, but we didn't really see differentiation in the purples as much. And yet, for scientific reasons, we actually cared about the low values as much as the high values. We were also worried about the fact that sometimes we got extreme high values, either for real reasons or for bad data, and that could draw the entire color map away and kind of wash out the rest of it. Um, so we first switched to a different color map um, that has more perceptual variation. Um, this is not a colorblind safe color map, um, so if you're colorblind, I'm sorry. Colorblindness is a really big issue, um, especially when you're creating visualization for communication. You want to make sure that you're using a colorblind safe palette. If you're using visualization for your own consumption and you are not colorblind, it is more important to have the ability to discover data, to make the discoveries with it. Um, just be sensitive to the fact that it, there are a lot of people that can't see, especially red-green differences. Um, so it's really important to be aware of, but it, there are times where it is valuable to use a color map that gives us more of the differentiation for those of us that can see it. So be aware. <laughs> but I want to caveat, this is not colorblind safe. Um, we took the standard color map, um, and so we get a little bit more variation. So we're starting to see uh, see some more kind of the, the shape around here that we couldn't see, and some of this starting to pop out here, a little bit of those reds that I, I couldn't really pick up here. Um, this is all the same data. Um, then we made a second chart where we did the exact same thing, but we flipped uh, min and max. Um, so now the blues that were here are reds here, and blues here are reds there. Um, this next one uh, is the same direction as the first one, um, but now we're clamping to the first standard deviation. So we're throwing out everything that's above the first standard deviation is um, set to blue, everything below is set to red. Uh, so we get more of that middle coming out, and we're actually really starting to see some of that variation that we could not see at all in the beginning, and that's actually really important here. Um, then we can also just look at the bottom half, min to median, everything higher is purple. And we have a fifth chart where we look at the top half. Um, everything higher, is, everything lower is red. So instead of looking at one chart, we now look at five charts every time. But it's actually much easier to interpret this looking at five charts than it was looking at one chart. We're much less likely to miss important signals, um, and we're able to compare and contrast between the charts. So there's a lot of value even in looking at the same exact data with five different visual forms that are related to each other. I'm choosing some examples from a wild. Um, choosing a diverging color map if your data is diverging is really important. Um, so in this case, uh, this is from Bloomberg. Uh, they're looking at annual world temperatures compared to average from 1880 to 2017. Um, and uh, they chose a really nice color map for this, um, especially that kind of has this sense of uh, 
blue is cold, red is hot <laughs> as well. Um, and a lot of nice uh, differentiation where you can see that the extremes pop out as well as the lower values. Um, this is part of a larger project that also includes uh, a line chart using the same color scheme. Um, so it's a nice example of, of using, um, setting purple to the middle and then going one direction is blue and one direction is red and using a really nice divergent color scheme that's a very appropriate because they're comparing to average. So both the length of the bar compares to average and the color reinforces that. Um, it's another example, uh, some of you might be familiar with this, CM Ocean color scales. Um, really a nice set of color scales uh, that are developed specifically for a lot of oceanographic data. Um, and they do a lot of things that we're talking about, like looking at oxygen content and having really clear cut points. Um, they have, I think they have a land, a land water one that also has a really clear break between land and water. Um, so being really thoughtful, not just about what colors you're using, but also what the break points should be. Um, the next topic I want to talk about is making small multiples. And by small multiples, I simply mean multiple similar charts that you look at at the same time. Um, so let's take another look at that demo with the numbers. Now we have 10 versions of the chart, and each one highlights, uses that technique from the beginning of highlighting um, to highlight a different number. Um, so now we can really quickly see that that one was very unusual. Uh, there aren't that many eights around, um, maybe lots more of kind of some of these middle values, and we can start asking questions about that. And there's value, I think, in not just having the 10 charts, but being able to look at them together, um, because then you have a sense of what, what normal is or what typical is, and you can compare and contrast, and you can see, like, oh yeah, like there are fewer eights than like nines, for example. Maybe that's interesting to you. Or maybe seeing where they're falling is interesting. But I think there's a lot of value in not just having the 10 charts, but having them on the screen together where you can see them at the same time. Um, this is an example of climate change small multiples. So again, just uh, seeing like, oh, the same thing is happening um, in a bunch of different places in the world, um, I think it makes a more compelling story than just seeing the global version. Um, and that, that you have that compare and contrast. In this case, like it's reinforcing the message, like we're seeing the same thing. Um, so somebody could be like, oh, well, it's just the same thing, like why have all the charts? But I think it really um, gives you this power of comparing and contrasting. Um, this is, again, uh, looking at that same work, this is another example. I both was talking about it from a color perspective, but also from a small multiple pers perspective. Like there's value to having five copies of the chart. Um, I mentioned some baby birth data earlier. This is an analysis I did um, looking at uh, when babies are born. So this is time of day from midnight to noon to midnight. Uh, and this is the number of babies born, uh, average number of babies born during that minute um, in the United States in 2014. Um, so when you look at this, uh, pretty big spike. <laughs> um, definitely something going on here. So the first thing I did was to drill down by day of week um, and to see what I saw there. So now I have seven charts, um, and this is a little bit process where I've like taken time to color the um, weekdays differently than the weekends. Definitely something different going on on weekdays than the weekends. Yeah. Um, it does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so when you start breaking this down by, uh, here's the view for cesarean sections. You can see that there's almost zero in the middle of the night. Um, so a lot of cesareans are, are planned for medical reasons. Um, uh, there's inductions and uh, spontaneous deliveries. And one thing I want to point out here is that in this case, now I have seven charts that basically look the same. And you might be like, well, why have seven when you could just have one? But I think there's actually a lot of value, especially in science, in seeing when there isn't a signal. It's valuable to see that, hey, all the days are the same. Like That itself is informative. Um, so there's times where even if the charts look boring, when you see them all, it's still valuable to see the multiple charts. Um, now, in this case, you can drill down by both delivery method and um, Tuesdays versus Saturdays. And now in these eight charts, we have a wealth of information um, in, in these eight charts, um, giving us a more complete view of what might be happening um, to influence when babies are born and what type of day, and might open up a whole suite of questions. Um, this was also a project that I ended up publishing in Scientific American. Um, and in that case, uh, there's a much more space constraints. It needs to be immediately understandable what's going on. Uh, but we still did as, oops, um, use small multiples strategically to provide context. In this case, it's three different uh, time, time drill downs. This is uh, uh, week of the year, this is hour of the week, and then 
uh, minute of the day. And then here's the delivery method breakdown. Um, so even in a situation where we're very space constrained, there was still valuable in having multiple copies of the chart to create this compare and contrast. Um, there can be too much of a good thing. <laughs> this was, uh, I had also uh, prototyped doing the full like um, 20, set of 21, and it was not as interesting as the, the previous set for communication purposes. So did stick with just six and not that many. Taking a look at some of your data here. Um, our friend, though, a wind direction and wind speed graph. Um, you can drill down. Uh, opacity is a really powerful tool with scatter plots um, that you might use already uh, because there's a lot of occlusion in our scientific data a lot of times, and we want to see the density, and we're often interested in the density. So if we start with a really high opacity where things are not, or where things are not very opaque, a high alpha, um, this helps us see kind of when did we have observation versus not? There was never a high wind speed around 175 degrees um, or around zero degrees. And that's important information. And as we drill down in our opacities, um, we get a sense of the density of our data. So most of our observations, we often get wind around like 10 to 20 degrees um, between a little over zero and 0.4. And then if the, it's easy to overlook, but there's actually a lot of times we don't have wind at all. Um, so it's very rare, I think, to do this, because I think we usually just kind of choose an opacity that's like pretty good for our data. But I think there's a lot of value in seeing multiple opacities at the same time. Um, you can do this in R with grid arrange, um, and you can do this in uh, matplotlib um, as well with subplots. Um, we can also drill down uh, by different barometric pressure. So now the data is in split into four charts based on the barometric pressure. This is low pressure, this is the highest pressure, um, and these are two of the intermediate values. So we can start uh, seeing how does the data, how does the wind speed direction relationship um, differ between low barometric pressure and high barometric pressure, for example. We might be interested in rain as well. We can use the technique of color to highlight the rain and look at when it's raining. Um, now the brightest blue is when it's raining a lot, the light blue is raining, when it's raining a little. We start seeing that um, it only rains in the in-between pressure and not in the other ones. Um, but we could also use small multiples for that as well. We could put the barometric pressure on the one axis and raining on the other axis. Uh, and now we can see that we have some charts where there just is no data because it never rained at that barometric pressure and that's useful information as well. Um, we can use other types of chart forms. Um, we can use radial. This is a radial scatter plot, so just taking um, the previous plot and wrapping it around a circle. Um, the one downside with this is that you start, it starts becoming hard to see um, distance from the center. Um, so we can also take a look with this same thing but using lines instead. The downside here is that it's hard to see small values, trade-off. Um, and we can small multiple that as well. So we can take the small multiple version um, of wind speed and direction. So the farther away from the center, the faster the wind speed um, and the direction is intuitive. And we can see the relationship between when it's raining and, and when it's not. So small multiple, all the same. Um, you can also do small multiples where you have the same x-axis in all the multiples, but different y-axis. Um, this is very common and a good idea with time in particular. Um, I didn't want to switch, deal with switching my Unix times. This is just December from start to finish. Um, we can see when it was raining. Uh, we can see the wind speed and wind direction at those times. We can also see here we actually had high winds with no rain um, and low barometric pressure. So start making comparisons across metrics by having an aligned um, x-axis. Uh, and maybe we decide that it's actually really interesting uh, to see both wind direction and barometric pressure with a time axis. So we can start using color. Um, this is the default, a nice blue spectrum. Um, I found it super unintuitive that light blue was high pressure, so I flipped the axis. Um, so if, if you're finding yourself misreading your charts, try to change something. Um, you can throw in a different color scale um, that might give you more uh, gradation. So in this scale, I immediately noticed this difference, that there's some blues here and lighter yellows. That, and down here, now that I know that it exists, I can kind of see like, yeah, that is darker blue but I didn't notice it until um, it popped out uh, with some of the more cute variation, because I think your eye gets more drawn to extremes with this type of scale. We can make it discrete instead. 
Um, we can also use small multiples on this. Um, so we can use both color and small multiples to break things up. So now uh, the top is low barometric pressure to high. Um, and this, we keep the context of the gray dots. Um, but in this case, uh, you can also do that with dropping the context of the gray dots. The question is, is the, um, is the other barometric pressures providing you useful context or not? And you might ask at this point, which one of these should you do? What is the answer? Um, which one should you run with? And the answer is, of course, that it depends. What are your goals? What are your constraints? What helps you see what is important in your data so that you can make the discoveries that you need to make? Um, if you're interested in learning more about DataViz, uh, there is a wealth of resources. Um, uh, Seaborn documentation um, is really nice. It's a Python library with good support for colors, small multiples especially, um, and it plays well with matplotlib, um, CM Ocean. Uh, for R, there's ggplots documentation. Um, if you're interested in perceptual distance and color maps, uh, I made an example recently kind of exploring if perceptual distance is consistent in different color maps or not, and also how much perceptual differentiation is there in different color maps. Um, Storytelling with data is an amazing, amazing resource um, looking at how you can learn, like, using principles of human perception um, to uh, communicate with data. Her focus is on communication, um, but the techniques are really valuable for analysis as well. Um, and then if you are at the point where you're communicating your results, um, where you definitely want to care about color blindness uh, in communication, um, where you want to um, have a message that you want to convey, um, her resources are really good for how do you tell that story effectively. Uh, Tamara Munzer has some nice work on kind of systematic thinking about visual forms. Um, flowing data is one of my favorite blogs, just kind of see what's out there, what are people doing. Uh, and you can check out my portfolio. Um, and OpenVizConf is a really nice data viz conference. Um, they also put all of the talks online, so you can look at the past five years of talks um, and see if anything is interesting to you. That's all. Thank you. Uh, how many programming languages are you fluent in, and like, how long did it take you to train in like each of those languages? Um, I'm really good at Google searching. <laughs> uh, the number of times I've searched for like um, color map, ggplot versus color map, seaborn um, versus JavaScript. Uh, I so I <laughs> my the first language I learned was Perl um, back in the day. Uh, when the university I was at um, had missed the boat as the world was switching to Python. Um, and then I learned R, oh, uh, yeah, then R. Uh, my first database was actually in Excel. Um, uh, I used R a lot. I did a lot of forecasting analysis, so I did use R for that. Um, that's when I got ggplot. I still find ggplot is the best thing for exploratory, just like quick, like, I want to facet, I want to switch, I want to switch forms, because it's really easy to switch forms. Um, that's why these examples were in R. Um, then I learned JavaScript, because I wanted to do interactive things, because they were shiny and cool. Um, and I really liked making, uh, the thing that's powerful about JavaScript in D3 is that I'm actually drawing the shapes. Um, so most examples, some, uh, a few examples were JavaScript, but not many. Um, that's where you get the world of interactivity. There's a lot of, there's, it opens a lot of possibilities when you can do things that are incredible and say exactly what you want because uh, you're really drawing the shapes. Um, but there, that took a while to learn also. <laughs> um, and 
now I'm using Python a lot because I'm doing a lot of collaborations with a team at Google that uses Python. Um, so I think it's, I kind of use whatever is appropriate to the situation. Um, and the main thing is just try to find, get, the, night, the better you are at your tool, the lower the bar is of doing new stuff. Um, so try to give yourself the, um, I have like a notebook, a Python notebook with like all of my kind of favorite techniques. So I have a place where I can go and be like, oh, I want to do that again. Like, how did I do that before? Or if I ever find a useful thing, if I'm working with somebody, I'm like, oh, this is a really useful technique. I want to do more of that. I just drop an example for myself, so I have a place to go back to. Um, but yeah, it's kind of the same. <laughs> That was a really interesting talk. I didn't realize this was a whole field with conferences and all these resources and things. Um, so just from your background, did you come at this from a coding first and applying it to science or vice versa? So I came in from, um, I was a data analyst when I got into data visualization. So I was, um, I was a data analyst at Google for six years. Um, and I was working on the revenue team. So I was analyzing revenue data. Um, and Google has a great internal training program where Googlers can teach classes to other Googlers. So Cole, who wrote Storytelling with Data, was actually a Googler at the time. Um, and she was also an analyst at the time, but she loved data biz. And so she made this internal workshop about data visualization. And I happened to be like, oh, this is cool. Like, I should go to that. And I went to it, and I was like, this is amazing. Um, and then evidently, right after that, one of the teams that I worked with had an intern who um, and then I got, I like transferred my like that data was amazing into this intern who came back a year later and he was like, oh, I went home and like everything had data in it and I like hadn't really remembered the conversations, but I felt like very excited about it because it was all I talked about for like the first month <laughs> after the workshop. Um, but I kept, I started using techniques more and more in my work just as I hope that all of you do. I went home and like literally the first thing I learned in that workshop was like color matters. Um, and so I started just thinking a lot more about color and being more intentional about color and being more intentional, intentional about small multiples. Um, and those are still kind of like the, the bread and butter core, I think, of a lot of the things that I think about. Um, and then over three or four years later, I was like, you know what, like the JavaScript thing is cool. JavaScript thing is cool. I want to make interactives like that. Um, and, and really focus, decide to focus 100% on data this. Um, there's a lot of talk in the data viz community of like, is data viz a profession or is it a skill? And I think it's both, the same way that writing is a profession and it's a skill. Um, and as scientists, you do a lot of writing, you do a lot of data viz. Um, they're both skills that you can have in your toolbox. Um, and hopefully, if you, um, and, and tap into kind of what some of that community is doing. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> So I do a lot of graphs for data that people send me. I put it up on our website, it's all static, and they look at it and whatever. But I've been trying to get into occasionally trying to do Java stuff and D3, and I spent months reading they do all the W3 school stuff, which is really simplistic, but at least it gives you an idea how they all connect. And then when you try to jump to actually doing something, there's like a Grand Canyon sized castle <laughs> between your ability to go from making a single line graph to taking your data and putting it on a thing and having a thing at the bottom that does the time and is, you know, how do you get from here to there? Without <laughs> going up? Because Googling isn't working for you. Yeah, yeah no, I wish, I wish I had a better answer to that question. My answer to that question was that I quit my job and spent nine months learning JavaScript. <laughs> 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 well, I like science. <laughs> um, um, unfortunately, it's that I wish I could tell you, like, oh, if you just walk around this way, there's a shortcut, and the chasm isn't there. Um, currently, currently getting to the point of like interactives and things that are animated, there is still a, there's, uh, there's still a jump of of learning, because it ends up being much more about learning um, JavaScript, learning web development, or learning animation, learning computer graphics type things. Um, I'd be happy to just take a D3 thing and get my data into it. I can't even. There are libraries. That'd be yeah, like, I know. I've been, I've got the libraries. I've got them on my yeah. computer. Nothing happens. Um, there is a, I mean, so before I introduced D3, uh, Scott Murray 
has a really good intro. Um, the intro book, um, there's good, often just changing examples. Um, there are a number of libraries that are on top of D3, so part of what makes it so hard is that D3 is not a charting library. This, like the way that ggplot and seaborn and matplotlib all have a concept of a bar chart, there is no D3 bar chart. Right. There are rectangles. <laughs> um, and what's cool about that is it means that making something bespoke and custom is about the same complexity as making a bar chart. The downside is that making a bar chart is really hard, <laughs> um, or more hard than it seems like it should be. Um, so there are a number of packages that are built on top of D3 um, that give you some of those, the common interactive hooks. Um, so I would definitely look to that. I don't know. I tried those too. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, um, I spent like two or three months, literally of time, <laughs> and I finally just decided I, I got to give up. So but I don't have time to do yeah. that, you know. The so good news is, the good, yeah, I, freel I do freelance. <laughs> <laughs> you can hire me. Um, uh, so part of it is hiring, uh, hiring somebody to help with that. Um, and the other good news is that uh, Mike Bostock, who wrote D3, is, um, has a small company now where he's called Observable and is trying to attack some of these problems. Um, so we'll see what comes of that. Um, I think people know, people know this is a really big challenge. Um, it's just not clear what the answer is yet. Any other questions? So is this all this visualization, is it more just kind of interactive and, uh, uh, or uh, is there some other publication that kind of tied to uh, all, this, all those methods to some, some sort of a you know, uh, science of fundamental properties of the you know, eye and the brain, the way how it process information, like like, like concept, maybe uh, the way humans process that, like, more sensitive maybe to deflection from the horizontal because when the people walk they can see that you know right mm -hmm. the somewhere far away and so more sensitive to constant like like slight inclination would mean that you speed that would need to spend more energy climbing that up so maybe more sensitive to the I don't know just that thing. Yeah. Out. So there's there's I mean there's definitely the field of um, human perception which I think is mostly focused on those on those very like how do humans um, and then there is um, a number of books that include, incorporate what we know about human perception as it relates to data visualization. So um, I did bring a couple of books um, of my favorites. Um, so this is the one I was talking about, Storytelling with Data by Cole. Um, she does ground things in, uh, in some of the gestalt principles and, and human perception and pre-attentive processing. Um, so she talks about that. I don't know how much Tamara Munzer talks about visual perception, um, but she talks a lot about kind of getting when, when you're into more of the the design side and thinking about the range of different visual forms you can use. Um, she talks a lot about that, um, and this is another intro. Um, there's an academic conference called InfoViz in a field that's really focusing um, on information visualization and um, they get into some of that kind of, they ask questions like, um, it's known that, or like they ask questions about like kind of comparing things in a bar chart, like can you, if two bars are closer together, are you better at comparing them than if they're far apart from each other, um, and questions like that. Um, so there, there is that side. Um, I think where it really makes a difference, the, the biggest difference is just that humans are really good at comparing length and position. We're not as good at comparing color, for example, um, for quantitative purposes. So, if you really, if you really care about the the value of it, and this is why scatter plots are so common in science, because scatter plots are really powerful because they're based on position. Um, so it's really easy to tell, like this dot is over here versus this one. This is they're here versus here, um, and that's at the end of the day, it's about visual perception. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely an academic field both on the more psychology side um, and on the visualization side. Um, but I think it's definitely growing as a field. Um, when I'm doing image analysis, I find it's really helpful to just slide around contrast and, and play with things interactively. And it's, feedback's immediate. You can kind of explore well, what are the best settings. It seems like in, you, you spend a lot of time playing with color maps, 
do you have any tools that will let you just interactively slide around the color maps and just and then something will pop and you'll say, okay, that's good, I'll remember that. <laughs> um, I, I am in the middle of a, the next project I'm working on, I will include that for a, for a particular client. Um, I'm not the only one who wants this, okay, good. No, 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 no I think it's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, you're, you're definitely not the only one that wants it. Um, I, I think it's an under, I think, I think people still don't necessarily realize how important the differences are, so they don't even know that they necessarily want to ask for it. So I think you're ahead of the curve. Um, and knowing that you want it. Um, the tool support is not there yet. I think part of the reason is that so many, the gra like, so many graphs are still static. Um, um, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great point. I think we should have tools that make that easier. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> I think what you're saying is it's coming. I mean, you're saying I think it's coming. In about two or three years from now, that'll be something that the toolkits will have. I, I hope so. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I think we're still focusing on, like I said, that it, that it matters. <laughs> um, but I, I hope that the toolkits get there. I think we will have more interaction.